conditions as well as some dermatology as well. Um, I have not practiced this, so we'll see how we go for timing. If you have any questions, you can email me. Um, I'm happy to answer anything or message me here. Um, and what we'll go through is we'll cover a few con presenting complaints because I think essentially that's how your OSCEs are going to start. You have to be able to come up with a decent list that you can then ask questions based on. You also need to know the respiratory conditions, so we'll go through them, um, as well as dermatology as well. So the way that your OSCEs will start will be shortness of breath, maybe a stridor they'll tell you about or a wheeze, but you can also, um, they also will present within the same OSCE and being able to work out if something's a stridor versus if something is a wheeze will limit your differential list and really help with where you're heading with your history. Newborn respiratory distress might not be an OSCE, um, but also have a look back at Alyssa's slides. And also Alyssa did a really great presentation on respiratory last year as well, which you should be able to find the slides for. In terms of your shortness of breath or someone presenting with a cough, thinking of your respiratory things is the obvious go-to. You can split that into upper or lower airway issues, but there are a whole host of non-respiratory causes of shortness of breath or tachypnea. Um, so we've obviously covered cardiac already, but also thinking about other things like lymphoma, um, thinking about DKA as well, because that can be something that can be quite tricky to miss and would pretty easily come up as a pediatric OSCE. Things that can irritate sort of the larynx and pharynx you should think about, um, as well as things that are going to make you just full of fluid. Because a lot of these conditions will end up having a pretty similar presentation, I'm just going to cover respiratory distress at the outset. I've put a link here to a YouTube video that you can go watch and actually have a look, of, a look at what um, intercostal recession looks like and what does it look like when a baby's actually head bodding? What does the grunting sound like? So you'll be able to pick that up. I think thinking outside of exams and looking towards what you're going to be like as a final year, as well as an intern, being able to pick up increased work of breathing in adult patients, in pediatric patients, in anyone, um, will be good because if you can pick that up, then maybe you can pick up on a patient that's deteriorating a little bit earlier. So we're obviously worried if we've got derangements in any of our vital signs, but we're not always, we're not just worried about tachypnea. If someone has um, a low respiratory rate as well, then they might have sort of gone all the way over increased work of breathing and now they're really crashing. Um, looking out for tripoding as well, if you're seeing patients in real life, Thinking about their mental state. So if they are starting to become drowsy and confused, then maybe um, they've also headed towards crashing as well because they're becoming hypoxic. Working out how much people can talk or like how much children um, can communicate and cry as well will give you a good idea of how hard they're working to breathe. So are they able to say a sentence before they have to get another breath in or is it words or can they not do anything? And the same goes for crying. Is it a really long cry or is it short crying or is there no crying at all? Um, this is from the Royal Children's Hospital, just an idea of what your normal ranges are. Essentially, the older you get, the closer you get to, no, uh, to like adult values um, and the younger you are, the faster everything is. It's like the general rule of thumb. You won't have to know it, but maybe if you wanted to keep a a bit of an idea of, you know, what's like when they're like, what's the standard values for your neonate, then maybe like a four or five year old and then teenagers. And then you've got adults essentially. Um, and then this is again from RCH, just about how the progression of respiratory depression is for your, your respiratory distress is for your mild, moderate or severe um, airway distress. So then your stridor or wheeze will give you some differential lists. So a stridor is usually inspiratory and it's more of a high pitched sound, um, usually has one tone to it. So monophonic and is generally associated with upper airway obstructions or things that are extra thoracic. A wheeze on the other hand can be quite varied, um, can be low or high pitched depending on what component is affected. So your um, smaller airways will have high pitch sounds, larger being low. Uh, and then in terms of whether it's monophonic, monophonic or polyphonic, generally 
um, your single airways will have will be a foreign body if you have the monophonic sound, polyphonic generally associated with asthma. I think in the uh, in the bottom there is a link to some videos for them as well. For your wheeze, it's um, there are different differentials based on the child's age. So we'll go through a lot of these more so. This is from Alyssa's slides as well. It was too good. I just had to steal it. Um, so bronchiolitis is a wheeze in a child less than one, generally. Um, and then the gap between being able to call something asthma can be filled with viral induced wheeze, viral pneumonitis, um, and then foreign body we consider all the time. So it just gives you an idea if, if similar to what Ben was saying this morning, that if you have their age, you can get a better idea of what conditions you have to think about. Uh, and in, an approach to management generally, when it's a bronchiolitis, we're not doing much, just supportive. One to five, we're looking at it sort of halfway between um, asthma, probably viral. We can give a little bit of salbutamol, but we're not going to go heavy handed on an asthma based approach. And after they're older than six years, then we're going down an asthma pathway, which we'll cover. The causes of stridor, so you can further group this into acute or chronic. I put some causes there and we'll go through them. The ones that we won't, that I haven't put in is essentially airway burns. The main things for that, it's sort of like real life things. If they've got um, soot or um, like um, singeing of the hairs, then you're worried that they've gotten um, burns into their airways. They can become edematous very quickly. So you preemptively intubate these people. For children or adults. Um, an approach to acute stridor, yeah, the main ones is crabby. So we've got croup, which I've put some buzzwords here, but we'll cover them a bit more in a second. The next one is abscess. So you can have peritonsillar abscesses, retropharyngeal, um, or Ludwig's angina, which is also an abscess. Anaphylaxis can happen to anyone. And essentially, if you've got exposure and then some of those classic symptoms, we're worried about that. Bacterial tracheitis, similar to croup, um, but quite a bit worse. Inhaled foreign body, as I've said, can happen to anyone and is really sudden onset. And your epiglottitis as well, um, which has some pretty much these buzzwords. So in the chat, can you please message me, what is this condition? Or what sort of conditions would you, would you be expecting if you saw these buzzwords? So a sniffing position, Hot potato voice, this person's got trismus, which is locking of the jaw. They've got drooling. They might have had some tonsillitis before this. And then the extra is that we have neck stiffness for an additional condition, and we might have submandibular swelling for a different condition. So there's sort of three in here. But I like the answers coming through. Good. It was a little bit vague. So some of you have given um, a different answer, which I will, I will accept because I'm nice. So these are generally buzzwords um, that we can see with peritonsillar abscess, Quincy, as well as our retropharyngeal abscess and our uh, Ludwig's angina. So to start with our Quincy, which is a peritonsillar abscess, usually it's strep, which causes tonsillitis. Now, What's happened is you've got these nasty looking tonsils and it just continues further back, usually on one side. So because you've got this abscess in behind your tonsils in here, um, it's sore on that side. You can see that there isn't a lot of space here. So when they're trying to talk, it sort of sounds like fish and they get trismus because they're, they've got an abscess in there and their muscles get really, really angry. They can get some drooling because it's quite hard for them to swallow. Um, so it can be somewhat difficult to distinguish from epiglottitis, um, but the this unilateral side of the pain might give that away. For all of these conditions, because we're dealing with the airway, we're hitting doctors ABCDE A, A, B, C, D, e first. Because it's an abscess, we're going to do an incision and drainage of the area, so referring to surge and doing Ben's lovely surgical workup. When you look at the back of their throat, you can see here, you've got one huge tonsil that's been pushed medially because of that abscess. And you can also see the uvula has been deviated. Retropharyngeal abscess is like just worse. 
So again, it can spread from your upper respiratory tract or like tonsillitis. Also, if someone's got a fish bone that's gotten stuck into the back of their throat, that can then um, allow an infection to spread. Usually when you look at them, they will have some neck asymmetry. And because it's heading down this yellow retropharyngeal space here, they can get quite a sore neck quite far down. It's an infection, so we might see some cervical lymphadenopathy. And you can see on this chest x-ray here that that whole portion here has moved away. Your trachea should be nice and central. So this person is, uh, will have respiratory distress and we're really worried about their airways. Depending on how bad it is, where it's located, we might do antibiotics. We might also need surgical interventions. We wouldn't really investigate um, we would obviously secure the airway before we investigate, um, but you can do a lateral x-ray and it would look something like this with the wide and pre-vertebral space. Ludwig's angina is the last one. These aren't really on your matrix, but still a bit good to know. This one is when you have usually a dental infection and it um, is a rapidly spreading infection, usually sort of a cellulitic infection of your sublingual, so at the bottom of the tongue and submandibular areas. Again, because you've got all this swelling, it can be hard to swallow, so they might be drooling. Trismus, because we're around the muscles of mastication, and also they'll look quite unwell. These patients can end up in ICU because we're really worried about their airways. All right, another question. So, yeah, so, sorry, to, to clarify about securing the airway, we might intubate if we think they're in imminent respiratory distress. We wouldn't... Um, we would try not to manipulate them too much. So children will generally end up in the position that they're quite comfortable in. So we would avoid doing a lot of that. But if we think that there is a risk that they will um, occlude their airway, then we might have to look at, you know, getting anesthetics involved and doing all those sorts of things. Um, yeah, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't intubate a lot of these. You wouldn't um, examine the throats for these children if they are super duper unwell, and we'll go through that for a few of them as well. Also, would you secure the airway in the in theatre? I think if you can get there, otherwise you'd get anaesthetics in and you'd probably be doing this like ASAP in emergency. You don't need to know a lot about all of them. So a previously well two-year-old, abrupt onset cough and shortness of breath. They've got moderate respiratory distress without any localizing signs. Chest x-ray shows mediastinal shift to the left and an expanding right lung. We've got lots of answers. Excellent. I'll, I'll also write up an answer to those questions. Inhaled foreign body. Excellent. So this can be really life-threatening because you can have like that, the question had an occlusion of one of the lungs. Usually you're around your toddlers um, or anyone who has that sort of develop me, developmental equivalent age. Um, because like us or people in the oral phase, um, usually there'll be a history that they were playing with something or eating, usually small um, bits of vegetables or small toys like Lego. Um, and the history will, will generally look towards a sudden onset something, whether it's coughing, choking, vomiting. You are not going to have an infective sign, so that will distinguish it from a lot of like your pneumonias and things like that. And they will have unilateral chest findings, and it will also depend on where it's actually dislodged. Um, if, you know, you've got it high up in your trachea, then you're looking at a respiratory arrest. So this is going to be quite a severe presentation. But if it's just occluding one portion of one lung, then it might be a bit more mild. You can do a chest x-ray and this can show lots of different things. It might show that chest expansion like the, the question that we did, but it might actually still be normal because a lot of the foreign bodies that children play with aren't actually radio opaque, so you might not see them. So in here, you can't really see what, what the actual foreign body was. The other thing with a lot of these, because they're emergencies, you're sort of mixing your investigations and your management. So... Again, when we're going to start with doctors A, B, C, D, E, doing life support if we have to, if they've come with that respiratory arrest. If they're more well and awake, we're going to encourage them to cough. And we can do the back blows and also chest thrusts as well and repeat that as much as we can until we dislodge it. If they do sort of take a turn for the worst, you can try and organise a laryngoscopy. They might do a surgical cricothyroidotomy if that is if the um, occlusion is higher. So if you can get below it to oxygenate, 
Otherwise, they might intubate and actually try and push the foreign body down into one lung so at least you can oxygenate the other side. And you're trying to get them to theatre as soon as possible to get that out. All right. We have a five-year-old boy recently arrived from Afghanistan presenting with a history of high fever, problems breathing. He looks very unwell, history with a fever of 39, respiratory distress and unable to swallow his secretions. Excellent. So this is epiglottitis. So the most common or the, the main causative organism for this is a Haemophilus influenza. Um, usually one to six-year-olds and usually a male at the very least in Monash land questions. The risk factors or what you'll see in this in the history is what we have in this question. So someone who isn't fully vaccinated for Haemophilus influenza, and that might be that they haven't completed the full course, or it might be that they've come from a country that we don't know if they've been fully vaccinated. These children are really unwell and they have the infective symptoms, so the really high fever. And we've got the three Ds, so distress, dysphagia, and drooling. They won't have a cough, and that's what distinguishes it from croup. Um, and they might have that sort of strider or a stirter, which is sort of more of a snoring sound. Again, like a lot of these conditions, if we distress them, they can occlude their airways. So distress equals arrest, so we just sort of leave them alone. We get everything ready. We do our doctor's A, B, C, D, E as much as we can. We've got PQ, anesthetics and ENT in because the plan for these children, because they generally present really unwell, is that we're going to do a laryngoscopy. So you can do that during intubation and we're looking at this sort of epiglottis. We'll see a cherry red epiglottis. You can see like there's no oxygen getting through there. If they can't intubate because of the swelling, they'll do a tracheostomy. And then the actual treatment is antibiotics and um, steroids to help with that swelling, as well as to actually address the bacteria. Um, and as an interesting side note, you give rifampicin to close contacts for these children. If they're not severely, severely unwell, and for some reason you manage to do a lateral x-ray, they have this thumbprint sign here, which is super hard to see, but it's essentially like a thumb of slightly more white or um, soft tissue pushing into that airway. All right, you're doing very well and we're going at lightning speeds. We've got a well two month old baby boy who is taken to see the pediatrician because his mother is concerned about noisy breathing. While he's asleep, the noise disappears, but it's really, really bad when he is upset. A slightly trickier one, good. Excellent, so I think most people have opted for a laryngomalacia. So this is when a baby just has a slightly more floppy airway and when they inspire, the, the structures sort of collapse on themselves. Typically affects a two to six week old baby and it's a chronic picture. So you can tell from that MCQ that it doesn't sound like it's sudden onset. It doesn't sound like um, it's an infective process because we wouldn't expect that, um, that they would get super well when they're asleep versus when they're awake. Like we wouldn't have that discrepancy if it was an infective process, generally. Um, so they have a chronic low pitched stridor and it's worse when they're crying, when they're lying down or when they're feeding. But if they're settled and if they're, like, if they're settled while they're sleeping as well, um, then it's better. It can be associated with gourd, so having more of a um, floppy airway and also um, your esophagus as well. They might have swallowing issues and it might be associated with a bigger picture of failure to thrive. If they do investigate them, then they can have this omega-shaped um, larynx, but generally they resolve by, by two years. If it's severe, so if they're having apneic episodes, um, then you can do then you can do surgery to fix this. All right. A four-month-old infant who was born at 24 weeks is noted to have both inspiratory and expiratory stridor at rest. Oh. 
Very nice. By the end of this, I don't want to say a single question mark. I want to say confidence. An exclamation point, perhaps. Excellent. So this one is another um, chronic stridor. So this is subglottic stenosis. The risk factor in this question that they've given you, it's a, it is tricky because there's not much to work with. This patient was a premature infant. So they likely were intubated when they were born. And what can happen is because of that, you can get um, damage to the airway. So that's usually the, the typical history is chronic um, or numerous intubations. And you can see here that instead of having collapse when you've got negative pressure sucking air into the, into the lungs, um, regardless of whether you're inspiring or expiring, that's a tiny hole and it's going to make a lot, of so a lot of noise. When they grow, it can get a bit better, but otherwise they might have to ablate this and try and make that hold, hole a bit bigger. Um, but don't really need to know too much about this. External compression is the other one. The main things to point out is, say, if you've got a rhabdomyosarcoma, so one of the ones that can affect the head and neck, and this can compress um, and cause a stridor that way, but they might have a normal larynx on examination. And the other thing is a vascular ring, which usually needs surgery. Most of these will need surgery. So there are all the like stridor-related uh, respiratory conditions that aren't on your matrix, but still good to know. So with the conditions that are on your matrix, we have a four-year-old girl. She has a two-day history of a barking cough. An examination reveals mild respiratory distress and inspiratory stridor. Excellent. Lots of exclamation marks. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it. Good. So we've got a resounding croup. So croup is also called laryngotracheobronchitis. And out of all of your stridors, this is the most common cause of an acute stridor. It's parainfluenza virus, which for the life of me during my exams last year, I could not remember. But croup ends in P, so parainfluenza is the answer, or is the cause for this. Generally, it's six months to six years, but happens mostly around the two-year-old mark because you've got an infection, you get lots of inflammation and secretions, and that's what obstructs the airways. If you have an underlying lung disease, makes sense. If you've got a narrow upper airway um, or you've already had croup in the past, then you're more likely to have a more severe inf infection. Like most viral things, we just have like a general unwellness for a couple of days, snotty nose, um, sore throat perhaps. Then what happens is they can quite suddenly develop a barking cough. Sounds like a seal. Um, and I've put a link in here if you want to have a look or listen to what one sounds like. They also have the stridor and they might have a hoarse voice, particularly worse at night. For these children as well, because we're dealing with an upper respiratory issue, if you try and examine their throats, they will become distressed and they might arrest. Um, they can look quite unwell, but they won't necessarily look toxic. That sort of term, uh, at least buzzword in Monash land, will be saved for a different condition. Um, in terms of your severity, um, with most things, if they're becoming drowsy, then we're, we're worried that they're becoming hypoxic. Your The loudness of your stridor doesn't correlate to how bad it, bad it is because your stridor might disappear because you don't have any air movement anymore. Um, their increased respiratory rate for how hard they're working will go up with the increasing severity. Um, and they'll work harder in terms of like muscle use and trying to suck as much air in as possible. And when you don't have to put their oxygen probe on when they're mild or moderate, trying to reduce a lot of the distress because they won't like that. But if they're severe, we are really worried. So we will have a look and it probably, they probably will be hypoxic. A lot of you might've seen mild croup when it doesn't feel as much of an emergency. Um, usually they're just treated with dexamethasone but it can be quite bad. And that's why we sort of assume that we're not going to examine them very much. And then once we work out that maybe they're a little bit better, then maybe we can do a few more things. Again, distress is rest. So don't really touch them, keep them with mum. And again, they'll keep that position that they're happy with. So if they want to have a slightly more sniffing position, then that's what's going to help them get the most air in. So we're not going to try and stop that. We're not going to sit them in the bed, just sort of leave them. 
if we do think that they're really bad, we're going to leave them. We're getting a plan together. We can give them oxygen and you can do nebulized adrenaline as well. And we're giving just stronger steroids. I put some discharge or admission information here, but I don't think it's particularly important, but I am not me if I don't go overboard. All right. So this child has an upper respiratory tract infection that has rapidly become a stridor. They appear toxic. They're vaccinated against Haemophila influenza and they have this staple sign on x-ray. What do you think it is? Good. The fact that this is a buzzword one means that I couldn't find a question on it. So I don't know if that gives you an idea of how common this has come up. Good, less confidence out there, but generally good answers. So this is bacterial tracheitis. This is also referred to as toxic croup and it's a staph infection. So it's actually a bacterial infection rather than the viral infection we had for croup. So it's worse. Again, they have the previous upper respiratory tract infection and then they've become rapidly worse. A lot of these cases might be initially managed as croup, but they don't get better with the management. And that's what tells us, okay, this is bacterial tracheitis. We need to chuck some antibiotics onto this. They actually might be quite tender over the trachea, which makes sense. They've got a bacterial infection there. Um, and they can produce a lot of mucus. So almost like pus, given it's a bacteria. We're also not going to distress these patients. If for whatever reason they're well enough and they get an X-ray, they can have a staple sign. So you can see that, you know, this, the trachea has become quite narrowed. They're not getting much air in there. You can do a um, culture and bronchoscopy, but really our priority is the airway. They might need to be intubated and we give IV kept triaxone given it's a bacteria. All right. A seven-year-old girl presents to the emergency department after eating a prawn sandwich. She has Mark Stridor, she's got facial swelling and cool peripheries. A little bit of a different question. What is our management? Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who eats uh, prawn sandwiches, but this young lady has. Good. So this girl has anaphylaxis. There's a big fancy um, definition, but essentially if you think of rash, so we've got skin changes, respiratory changes, gastrointestinal and cardiovascular, and you don't need all of them to diagnose it, um, just some of them. If the, the worst conditions of anaphylaxis or the worst cases are usually in adolescents, if they've got nut or selfish allergies, if they've got a background of poorly controlled asthma, um, if they don't get treatment early enough either. Some triggers here, classic ones being nuts, bees and penicillin. Um, the features, so it can happen quite quickly. It can also happen four hours later, which plays into why we keep patients so long is because they can have a biphasic um, or a delayed reaction. They'll get uh, swelling and they might get the rash stridor because of the swelling. They can have a change to their voice because of the swelling as well. And they'll be shocked. Usually distributive shock is anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is the only time when you will give adrenaline before you've necessarily gone through all of your a, B, C, D, E's, because it's essentially what's going to help them. You'll help the airway, you'll help the breathing, you'll help circulation, you'll do all of it. The only other things you can do before that, remove the allergen if they've still got the bee sting in there. Um, if you can do something to get rid of it, do it. Keep them lying down because their blood pressure is dropping, so we don't want them to faint. Oxygen and then getting that I am adrenaline. So for children, it's 10 micrograms per kilo of one in a thousand adrenaline and the maximum dose being your adult dose is 0 0.5 mils. Lateral thigh, trying to avoid the big um, arteries in the leg. And you can repeat it five minutes later if they don't respond. You can give salbutamol and antihistamines for the other symptoms, but you'd give that after your adrenaline because it's not actually going to address the anaphylaxis. We keep an eye on them four hours after their adrenaline and also because of that biphasic response that I was talking about. And then you could potentially get a counselling station for someone who has had anaphylaxis or you might be asked if there's a question at the end. The important things to do would be an anaphylaxis action plan, plan 
And you also need to send them home with two EpiPens, not just a script for EpiPens. Because if they go and have an anaphylaxis, you can't treat anaphylaxis with a script. For children less than 20 kilos, you give them an, the EpiPen Junior, which is the green one. More than 20 kilos, just a standard EpiPen, which is the yellow one. Um, I had a question. How do you clinically differentiate between toxic croup and abscess and epiglottitis? They're going to be pretty similar. Your toxic croup, um, I'm going to come back to it because I got to think, got to put my thinking hat on for that. I think your toxic croup is going to look the worst. Epiglottitis, you'll have the um, drooling, which you won't necessarily see in the toxic croup. And then the history will be different in terms of progression for your abscess. It's usually a tonsillitis. Um, that then gets worse versus your epiglottitis, it sort of started a bit more suddenly and you're going to ask about their vaccinations. So that can distinguish some of them. All right. An eight-year-old presents to the GP with itchy and watery eyes, runny nose um, that started since her cross-country training at the end of term three. She has a previous history of eczema. Good. It is also me. I don't know if anyone else is suffering with hay fever today, but it's absolutely horrid. So this is allergic rhinitis. So this is um, when you have inflammation and irritation of the oropharynx. Usually happens in the setting of eczema and also asthma. Can be all year round, which is usually grass, or happens when certain, actually, no, sorry, seasonal is when it's the grass, so in different phases, perennial is all the time, which is usually dust mites. They'll be sneezing, they might have nasal polyps because of the mucosal swelling, um, and they'll get this bi bilateral watery eye, like glassy eye conjunctivitis. They can get this, um, I love this, it's called allergic salute, which is like this, and it can give you the creaks across the nose as well. The way you can investigate this was sort of allergy testing um, and managing it with antihistamines, which is the second generation mainly, which makes people not as um, sleepy. You can do intranasal corticosteroids. You can get some sort of like uh, increased intraocular pressure if that goes for too long. And you might do immunotherapy if it's quite bad. Um, we have a nine month old, mildly febrile baby with a cough, shortness of breath, respiratory distress, recent upper respiratory tract infection for her brother has wheeze and crackles. Good. I'm going to keep moving on because I'm doing very bad for time. Um, this is bronchiolitis. This is a different uh, virus from croup. So respiratory syncytial virus, I think bronchiolitis virus, they sort of go together. If you are premature, if you have bronchopulmonary dysplasia and, it, and you also have smoke exposure, there's some big risk factors that they might put into a stem for you. This is what we were talking about when you've got a wheeze in an infant that's about less than one um, and they might have sort of a viral component to it. In a really bad case of bronchiolitis, they can have apneic episodes. Um, so a bad bronchiolitis turns your baby blue is how I remember that. And then they might have lung findings, they might not. Otherwise, it would just be a generalized wheeze. Because if you think of sort of wheezes and asthma as an obstructive issue, they can get a hyperinflated chest, so they might have a palpable liver. There's an ass a severity assessment here. It's pretty self-explanatory. If you're having apneic episodes, that's quite bad. You don't need to investigate these children, usually a clinical diagnosis, but they will show a hyperexpanded chest. This chest x-ray is normal. It's actually a thymus, which I quite liked. You essentially just support these children. So oxygen, if their oxygen concentration is low, giving them feeds as well, because, because they're working hard on breathing, they might not be eating as well. You can give an antiviral if they are high risk. Um, and then just educating the parents of the normal trajectory. But generally, medications like salbutamol, antibiotics, haven't been proven to help. All right. A 12-year-old boy has a persistent cough um, with corrosal symptoms. He has severe coughing. He turns bright red in the face, but he feels well in between. Yes, thank you, Lauren. It's bad. 
Um, so we have whooping cough. Bordetella pertussis is the main thing to know. Um, thinking about patients that haven't had their immunization, so that can be up to sort of like six months, four years. Typically you start okay, you get the really spasmodic coughing with the, the whoop um, and you can have a post-tussive emesis, so a vomit afterwards. Um, and then afterwards you can have a cough for a, a, a real long time. It's usually a clinical diagnosis. You can do a swab. You can also do um, pertussis serology, which you're looking for IgA. Um, in infants less than six months, this is when it's the worst. So they'll have weight loss, pneumonia, and potentially an encephalopathy. We can try to help this with some antibiotics, which are usually macrolides, different for children or neonates. It can decrease how infectious they are, but doesn't seem to actually help with the course. The main thing that you can do to prevent this overall is vaccinate and also have the family members vaccinated as well. I'm going to skip the questions because we're doing poorly. Pneumonia in children, pretty similar to pneumonia in adults, viral causes or strep pneumon uh, pneumonia. If you have recent hospitalization, cerebral palsy or other lung conditions, then you're at higher risk. Um, if like for all pediatric conditions, if you are younger, you will present quite more vague. So irritability and fever, um, and you should have this on your list for just a fever presentation. They'll have the same productive cough. Um, and when you listen to their chest, they'll have unilateral findings. So like crackles, bronchial breath sounds. Um, and it can uh, progress to being quite bad. We manage these children supportively for mild. So you don't actually have to do a lot if it's mild because it's probably viral. The worse it gets, the more likely it is to be uh, bacterial. So we're looking for amoxicillin and keftriaxone. Is this asthma? Asthma, good. <laughs> so asthma, I think you'll know a lot about. It comes up in GP as well. So it's pretty well covered. Um, it's common, it's associated with eczema as well as hay fever, and it's a type one hypersensitivity reaction. Um, I think the differences that you should know compared to when you learned asthma in 3B is that you should have a, a better idea of how to do a severity assessment. So what are the triggers? Have they ever been to ICU with this? Because that's going to change your management if they have a flare. If they have interval symptoms, so between the crises, do they have coughing at night? Do they have shortness of breath? Those sorts of things. And on their current treatment, how is their control? Your FE, your spirometry can really only be done once a child is six years or above. And we're looking for that classic obstructive picture. In terms of how to assess the severity, there are, you have a look at how bad their flares have been in the past. So mild, moderate or severe. And also having a look at um, how frequent their symptoms are between their flares. If it's less frequent and also pretty mild, you, you can get away with a SABA, so salbutamol PRN. The worse it gets, the more likely you are to need some additional preventers on top of that. Um, the level of control, that's for your own interest. The stepwise management, everyone needs to be educated and have an asthma management plan. Everyone starts with a PRN reliever, so a SABA like salbutamol. If you need a preventer, you can just add on an, a low dose um, inhaled corticosteroid and if you then need an extra layer you can either increase to a high dose or you can add a larva to your low dose inhaled corticosteroid um, and a specialist review if you're getting beyond that this is a picture for you um, and then this is a bit of a cheat sheet if you want to learn or like just have a look at okay what's severe and what's not in your acute asthma um, you have the risk factors. The main thing to think about is if, if someone has a history of anaphylaxis, then they're more likely to have a worse flare of acute asthma um, and also previous ICU admissions. They'll have the classic sort of chest tightness, cough, um, respiratory distress as well. And we're looking for our moles, so mental status, oxygen, work of breathing and speech for how severe they are. The main thing to remember that I'm sure people have mentioned time and time again is that if you aren't hearing anything on their chest or you aren't hearing a wheeze, that can mean that they might have passed over into being really bad. The stepwise management. So in the community, you're recommending four by four by four. So four breaths. With um, So four puffs with four breaths between each puff repeated every four minutes and calling triple zero if there's no relief after the second round, but continuing while you wait. 
an emergency, um, giving them oxygen, sitting them upright. And for the basic approach that you'll need to do for yourselves is a SABA, SAMA and steroids, um, which if you remember, less than six is six puffs, more than six is 12 puffs, and then four and eight for your hypotropium. Pretty much everyone gets steroids once they hit moderate. And the next step up from there is magnesium sulfate if it's really bad. Um, when you're discharging, doing an asthma action plan is going to be the main thing to make sure um, that next time we've got a plan in place and they've got a review checked in. And again, a little bit of a cheat sheet for you. This is cystic fibrosis. It's more of a pediatric condition than it would have been in 3B. Autosomal recessive and one of the most common one, uh, most common one in white people. There's an explanation here if that had to come up, but essentially their, um, their fluids become way more sticky and thick. This is part of your newborn screening test. So you're looking for plasma um, trypsin, um, which can give you an idea of whether you've got to do further investigations. Essentially, every body system will be affected. Um, so failure to thrive is a common one in infants, bronchiectasis once you hit, um, once you're a child, and diabetes is one of the complications long term that we worry about. Um, investigations. I think one of the questions that comes up is a child who has like um, soft bones or like is more likely to break, who has a history of um, cystic fibrosis because they can't uptake their fat soluble vitamins because their pancreas shuts down. Management is um, multidisciplinary teams and you are really trying to just sort of slow down progression. So giving them high energy foods um, and then in terms of your pancreatic function, you can replace the enzymes so the exocrine function of your pancreas, also giving those vitamins back um, and then trying to help loosen up a lot of that mucus. So mucolytics, um, antibiotics prophylactically as well as therapeutically. Um, this one is tuberculosis. Again, you would have covered this in 3B, um, just keeping it in, in the back of your mind for children as well. I put in a summary of the physiology because it always confused me. So there's a nice summary there if you would like it. Um, essentially, during the primary stage, you're not seeing a lot, but secondary is when mostly um, we see it. So that's the classic loss of weight, night sweats, night sweats and homoptosis. Um, it just might be harder to draw that out in a sort of pediatric history. So making sure you think about how can I actually ask this for a child. Management is rifampicin, isoniazid, perizinamide and ethambutyl, just like adults. This one is OSA, it comes up a little bit in children, usually can be caught or like have a background of neuromuscular conditions. So if they have collapse of their airways, um, but things that we can fix would be enlarged adenoids. The children might describe sort of really sleepiness. They might have issues at school because of the sleeping. Really, the way we manage it is you can take out the tonsils weight loss if obesity is a contributor, otherwise CPAP to really overcome that obstruction. I put notes in for dermatology, but again, you would have probably covered these in GP. I think the main one to know pretty much back to front is eczema. Um, in children, it starts from six months, which is different to your seborrheic dermatitis, which usually starts um, a bit earlier at about three months. The distribution actually changes when you are an infant compared to when you become sort of more school aged. Typically, the question they'll give you will have elbows and knees. So sort of here with your um, the erythema, it doesn't have a very good marking. It has flaking to it. Um, and you can also see that it's quite dry as well. It'll happen on the cheeks on infants first and children can have it on like the extensor surfaces instead. Um, I think in your history, good things to ask about would be an overlying infection. So um, impetigo or uh, herpes on top of your eczema um, would be good things to ask about. Have you seen any crusting, any fevers, any oozing, those sorts of things. Um, your ABCDE of management, essentially just keeping it as moist as possible with the greasiest things you can find um, and using topical corticosteroids, really mild versions on the face and on the thinner skins and then stronger versions on the trunk and the limbs. Um, stomatitis is the only actually only other R1 that comes up um, and is the primary infection of your herpes. So 
the older you are, the older the child is, when they get their primary infection of HSV-1, the worse it will be. You can get involvement of all of the lips, the tongues and the throat. The main issue that comes up is um, the dehydration that comes from having like this really, really sore throat. Um, it looks like vesicles or sort of like ulcers that you can see on the lips here as well as around. Um, management essentially comes down to helping with that dehydration because of how sore the mouth is. But there is a risk that this can present a progress to encephalitis, um, which we want to keep an eye out for. So you would treat with acyclovir if this patient was in immunocompromised. Um, that's 45 minutes. Essentially, the rest of them you can read through. There are twos. Um, cradle cap and babies is the only other one. Sorry, that went so fast. I'll answer all of these questions um, in the big document, if you're happy with that, Luke. Yeah, sorry, everyone. Yeah, too fast. Oh, good. You covered a lot. So that was really good. Thanks. Um, okay. Let me get out of here. It was fast. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> All right, I think I'm up. Uh, or is there a question type? Yes, no, I was just checking.